Other than that, I would like to introduce John Russo. Thank you. So I'm going to put my paperwork down here. I'm, I said I wasn't going to use the microphone, but I will walk around because uh, I like stalking a stage. It's just a little easier for me. Uh, you have some graphs and charts that we prepared for this uh, presentation. Uh, you'll have to forgive me that uh, having been your city manager for a grand total of 14 weeks, um, you may find that there are some questions you're going to ask me, and I'm going to say, I don't know. And you're just going to have to forgive me if I don't know yet. Um, but I wanted to talk briefly about the two things that Jeff started with. First, um, we were pleased as a city today to uh, receive from the United States Navy a term sheet for the conveyance of 918 acres of the Alameda Naval Air Station. Um, that area um, includes 140 acres that we will get June of 2012. That's the location uh, that we are proposing for the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory site. Um, most of the base will be conveyed to us in the rest of 2012, but the two key points are this. One, up until now, the Navy has asked for $108.5 million for the base. This is a no-cost conveyance. So, so that's one. Two is they retain all responsibility for toxic remediation. So now, um, those areas which are not yet remediated will be conveyed to us as they become clean property. Uh, some of you spoke with me back in June at a league meeting, and some of you have spoken with me since then for other reasons. Uh, I gave an interview to the Express before I be right before I became city manager. I said then we needed to get to the basic problem at the base, which was we could not develop the base at all until we had a new deal with the Navy. Your staff has worked in a very focused way for the last 14 weeks on making this happen. Uh, those of you who know Jennifer Ott, I would strongly urge you to give her a pat on the back because she did most of the work. I'm standing here taking the credit, but Jennifer did most of the work. Um, it was a terrific process. Now we have to move to the next stage. The term sheet will be voted on on Wednesday night by the city council sitting as the ARA. Uh, on Wednesday, October 5th, the report has been available since last week online. It's interesting, nobody in the press picked it up, and uh, Lauren Doe in her blog picked it up yesterday, and we all scampered and said, okay, well, this is leaking out now, and so they're starting to notice. <laughs> we were frankly trying to, we were working with Senator Feinstein's office and trying to get her to be here for the ceremony. We could not make that happen in time. but. There are plenty more steps on this process. This really is just the beginning of the real road. By the end of the calendar year, it is our intention to enter with the Navy, and this is what the term sheet calls for, to enter with the Navy into a memorandum of agreement that will really flesh out these basic terms, because there's a lot of legal mumbo jumbo we got to do. And if there's any problems, we'll ask you, Judge, to help us out. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> Don't look around. You know I'm talking to you. So that, that MOA should be done in December. Um, the first property is the site for Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, the 140 acres I talked about. What had happened was the conversation with the Navy was going so well over a no-cost conveyance of those 140 acres that we decided to uh, explore, well, you know, if it's going so well, why not just convey the whole thing to us? <laughs> And, uh, you know, because I figure, don't ask, don't get, right? You know, what can they say? No. Well, I, then we're still where we were. They said, okay, we'll talk about it with you. So the long and the short of it is uh, we went back to the original 1996 reuse plan, which calls for a maximum of about 2,000 units. By the way, over 500 units have already been built with Bayport. That leaves us about 1,400 and change units that can be developed at the base as part of the no-cost conveyance. For every unit where we go over that 1,400 and change, or a total of 2,011, I think is the full number, the Navy gets $50,000 per unit. They become, in effect, back-end partners. But I think that creates a disincentive for the development community to keep coming to us with proposals that are overly reliant for Alameda's needs on residential. 
Uh, I'm not going to take questions till the end of the, of the presentation. Thanks. So that's kind of where we are. Uh, so they are our back-end partners, but they clearly do want to discourage going over that number. And uh, that's okay with me. So, uh, although I'm not the policymaker, as you know, the council is. Um, so that was uh, announcement one. A couple of you, um, Corinne, for example, was there. Uh, a couple of you uh, may have seen our uh, presentation last Tuesday night where we did a nearly two-hour presentation on public sector labor relations and labor law. This was an outgrowth of the controversy in June, my first full meeting, uh, where the firefighters contract was uh, on the table for the council. And at that time, uh, it was clear to me that there were good people who were um, unaware of how, what the rules of the road were. And so I thought it was important that we have that educational session on Tuesday night. If you haven't seen it, please do try to get to see it. It's, it is definitely, in parts, a little arcane, but it does provide a timeline as to where public input can be uh, brought to bear. On October 25th, we will be conducting our first budget workshop. This is for the 2012-2013 budget. We will be eight months early in beginning this process. We want public input. What we will give at that meeting from staff, frankly, will be not very complicated. We will show the closing numbers for the last fiscal year, because the closing numbers aren't always what you predicted they would be. We'll see how well we did on our predictions on revenues and expenses, what uh, unforeseen um, one-time hits one way or the other came in or went out. We'll present those to the public. And we will ask the council to begin instructing us on what their concerns are going forward. And at that time, we would like to hear, and I genuinely mean this, we would like to hear from the public what their thoughts are about where we're going to be going forward. I'm going to talk with you a little bit tonight about what I think the Alameda budget is about and what the stressors are on that budget. And there are many. And all of them uh, exist in a political context and a political environment, and that's the reality. Um, but within that, uh, we can talk very bluntly about what they are. Uh, that's on the 25th. On the 11th, I'm going to throw this up too, we just released tonight at 6 o'clock, which is why I was being interviewed, and I'm sorry I was a couple of minutes late. Uh, tonight we uh, released the uh, independent review of the Crown Beach uh, drowning slash suicide. Um, that independent review uh, was performed by a former state fire chief, uh, Ruben Grijalva, who also has experience as a police officer, with consultation with a uh, suicide intervention specialist at Cal. Um, and uh, that's going to be at the council on October 11th, where Grijalva will present the report live in person and take questions uh, from the council. Of course, public input is encouraged. Uh, proposed questions to the uh, council to share with Grijalva are encouraged. Uh, I can tell you I've read the report. It's extremely thorough. It is what I asked for. It's a how did we get here that day. It is a minute by minute chronology of what happened that day. And it is a, uh, a, a menu of 14 recommendations about what the city should be doing in the future. I would anticipate at that meeting the council will direct staff on which of those recommendations they want to pursue, or all of them. We intend to suggest to council at that meeting, which of course is their prerogative, that in February we return with what progress has been made on implementation of those recommendations. It's one thing to give us direction and recommendations. It's quite another to get them implemented. And I think we need to have accountability uh, from your staff on that. And as the head of the staff, I intend to impose that accountability based upon the policy direction of the council. So with that, there's a lot going on. Uh, the council, which is used to meeting every two weeks, will be meeting, uh, started meeting every week, uh, every Tuesday following Labor Day. You broke your own rule. <laughs> I'll pay the fine. I'll pay the fine. Um, so the council, uh, met on the day after Labor Day, short meeting to be sure. Council is meeting every Tuesday from here to November 8th. Um, 
Now, I've told staff that we're all going to miss each other so much on November 8th. I'm so sad because we'll have gotten used to each other that I'm actually going to have staff, not council, because I can't do to the Brown Act. Um, but I'm going to have all the staff over to my house for pizza just because, you know, we're going to miss each other. We're so used to seeing each other <laughs> on Tuesday nights. I did say when I got hired that um, I thought there might be a little bit of culture shock uh, for me coming here, but also for the organization in having me be here because there's a lot to be done and my intention is to get things done as quickly uh, and deliberately as possible. Uh, time is a wasting about the things that need to happen. So let's go quickly through these charts. Uh, this first chart, this one here, is uh, that's the expenditure summary and where is the where do we get our money from chart. Here it is. All right, where do we get our money from? So this top chart, which you can read for yourselves, I don't have to read it for you, but just so you understand what this is, the 40% here in purple is called other taxes, and that 40% is then broken down in the lower pie chart. Okay, so when it says, for example, 22%, that's not 22% of all of our revenue, it's 22% of the 40%. So it's more like, 8% okay, of the total revenue. So if you take a look, you can see that um, about a third of what we get is property taxes. Sales tax, very, very small. 6% is just not enough for a city of 75,000 people with the kind of disposable income this city has. Um, Over-reliance on utility user tax, 33% of that 40, which means about 12%, uh, is in utility user tax. Now, that's not a terrible thing given the fact that we own AMP, and because we own AMP, we get cheaper rates than PG&E, so some of it kind of comes back to us, but that's, that's a little high. Uh, what you'd like to see, I think, in the longer term is you'd like to see a little more on the um, hotel taxes. You'd like to see some more in sales tax. Here's the problem for our revenue source. If you take away... Um, South Shore Mall, Park Street, Webster Street, some of the North Shore area, kind of Marina Village, and um, uh, Harbor Bay Business Park. If you take out those five clusters, guys, we're basically Piedmont here. It's just property tax and, and just utility taxes and fees. The way we're going to solve the budget crisis that the city, I hate the word crisis, let's just call it the budget shortfall, the structural shortfall that we face. The way we're going to solve it is got to, we've got to come at it. It's too large for us to come at it only from one end. We can't just come at it by cutting services or givebacks from public employees, which both of which are coming. But on the other side, we're going to have to raise some revenues, and we don't want to become um, as highly taxed as the unfortunate town that I live in, where I pay incredible taxes on my property taxes for very minimal services, frankly. Um, that's not a direction we ought to be going. On the other hand, and you've heard it here first, we are conducting a comprehensive review of our fees. And I will tell you that what I've looked at so far, we are not only the lowest in the East Bay, but we are the lowest by a lot. It's not a little. We're not talking about we're the lowest by 5% or 10%. There are some areas where we are like at 40% of the average. That can't go on. There's a reason why everybody else has those fees at those levels. Our intention, and I have to bring this to council, and council will have to approve it, our intention would be to stay with the lowest fees, but not 50% or 40% you know, of what the next guy is, is doing. We need to get more a closer approximation, and we intend to raise some revenues there, and that won't be popular. As I said to one of your council members yesterday on the phone about a different issue, change doesn't make you popular. Change makes you unpopular. If it made you popular, you wouldn't have to do it. Someone else would have done it already. <laughs> People always talk about change because they want to be popular, because everybody says, oh, I want change, I want change. But see what happens when you make change. Those of you who read Machiavelli and aren't all freaked out because, oh, it's Machiavelli, can the church ban the book, you know, back in the day. I mean, if you read Machiavelli, he says, never be a reformer. Because if you're a reformer, the benefits of reform are inchoate, and those who are benefiting from reform, it's a general good thing. 
they don't know who they are yet. And so they're not going to help you fight for the reform. But those whose ox is gored by the reform have existing interests. And they will come and kill you. And he meant it back then. They will come and kill you in the 16th century. Now they won't come and kill you. Now they'll just say mean things about you. Ooh. OK. So, um, or maybe they don't get you reelected. OK. Well, that's life. Never really hurt me in Oakland. I kept getting reelected even though I said what I thought. Um, so second, where does the money go? So you have a chart that tells you where the money goes. This is the general fund expenditure summary. Now, this is actually two different slices of the same pie. So the top one tells you where the money goes based on department, but the bottom one tells you what types of expenditures. So that, because if not, if you get the top part without the bottom part, you really don't have the entire picture. Not surprisingly, police and fire are two thirds of the general fund budget. That's pretty much standard where uh, cities have uh, their budgets in general fund. Not in all funds, but in general fund. That's not unusual. What is interesting to me here is that personnel only represents 65% of the budget. I'm used to being in, in organizations where personnel represents like 90% of the budget. So that's interesting, and I don't understand why that is. I'd love to know more about that. And I'm sure you would too, and you probably freaked out that your city manager doesn't know why, but I don't yet. Um, then there's the all funds budget, and that's this chart here. And uh, you can see the general fund, and this is interesting actually. Uh, in Oakland, the general fund represents about half of the all funds budget. Here in Alameda, it only represents 36%. And so one of the things that's uh, always interesting to me about an all funds budget that is almost three times the size of, uh, three times, the, well, twice the size of the general fund budget is all fund, uh, other funds, excuse me, um, is so much of the uh, argument and debate and attention is paid to the general fund budget, but that only is about a third of what we do. And there's all this other money here that's being spent, special revenues, capital projects, all of these different funds. I want to note one thing for you. Internal services is listed as 6%. Um, these are a budgetary device. And what they are are, it's, these are the charges that are charged to other departments and funds to, to allocate the internal services. So for example, if, um, if Public Works fixes something in the police building, that is an internal service charge. And it comes from the police budget and goes to the Public Works budget. Now, there is a tremendous amount of uh, unhappiness in the executive management team about how the internal service charges are calculated. And we, by the end of this calendar year, will, and, and in time for the budget, we are doing something, and I don't know where it will lead us, but we are reviewing all of the internal service charge calculations to make sure they accurately reflect what's going on in the organization. Because many of these formula are more than a generation old and may no longer be applicable. And it seems like a small thing, but it's actually a very big thing. Because if I'm a department head and I know that solving problem X is going to cost me a ridiculous amount of money, I might let it go and let it go and let it go till it becomes problem triple X. So that's a big deal. It looks like a small issue, but in terms of how the organization, uh, the internal um, incentives and disincentives within the bureaucracy itself work, it's very important that this be accurate. Again, I don't know where it's going to lead us. I really don't, but I know it's got to be done. And wherever it leads us, we will deal with it. But I think it's very important that when we're budgeting, we work in reality. I actually think for most policy issues that it's important that we work in reality and minimize irrationality and fear and those things, and that we confront issues as they really are, not as we wish them to be or as we fear they may be. 
I'll come back to that when I talk about the golf course. Um, <laughs> now, what does the Alameda budget need in the next five years? All right, Alameda Point. I think some folks who know me and know that my politics tend to be, you know, I was a former legal aid lawyer. Um, I tend to be all for social programs and affordable housing and things like that. And that's all great, and that's who I am. And that's how I live my life, and that's where I give my money, and those, that's all great. But looking at operating a public municipal corporation, you have to accept that because of Proposition 13, and I don't want to debate Proposition 13 tonight, and please don't stand up and tell me Proposition 13 has to go, yeah, I know, I know, I know, it does. It is, but it's never going to happen. So at least it's not going to happen any time that's operational for us. With Proposition 13, property taxes are expressly limited into how quick, they're very sticky. They can't really go up all that much. That was the social trade-off that was made in Proposition 13. But the cost of service provision goes up at the rate of inflation or more, which is nearly always more than the limit in the property tax increase. So the idea that a city will grow its way by adding residents, that it will grow its way out of a structural deficit is a fallacy. You cannot grow your way out of it with residents alone. Now, the argument that gets made is you bring in more residents, it creates greater internal markets, and those internal markets will generate sales tax and, and more jobs and the like. That's great, but when you look at a budget where only 6% of what you're taking in already is sales tax, it means you got a long way to go with what you have here in the way of people already in capturing more sales tax. So bringing more people in, let's worry about the people we already have to get more opportunities to capture sales tax here. Not to mention, as I spoke earlier about we have these five nodes that generate taxes for us, we need more business-to-business -business sales taxes. What happened with Alameda Point is that when the Navy shut Alameda Point down, even though the Navy wasn't expressly pay paying property taxes, the economic activity generated by having that many people on the island working and shopping and doing things here, that loss has to be recaptured. The way to grow the Alameda economy is to take both ends where you have capacity for more offices, research and development, building, uh, office buildings, pardon me, uh, sales. Those things are where you can actually, Alameda has this great opportunity. That's what the base used to be. It was the economic driving force of the island. It needs to be that again. Likewise, Harbor Bay Business Park is underutilized and needs to be built out. If you can build out, I mean, so many cities that are in our position have, have it much worse because either their income levels are lower, their public safety problems are greater, or they're completely built out and they got nowhere to put the economic activity. We actually have this base to put the economic activity in. Now, how did we end up with 14 years of going nowhere? Everybody wants to find someone to blame. I actually think it's really understandable how this happened. And I'm totally not interested. You will hear this over and over again. I am so not interested in blaming people about things. Uh, just analyze it. Here's what happens. You got the base. Navy says, we'll convey it to you for no cost, but you can only build 2,000 houses. Development community comes in and says, geez, you got like more than 100 million, who knows how many hundreds of millions of dollars of infrastructure costs here, because this infrastructure is no good, which is true, it's no good. Put aside, the Navy's got to do the toxic remediation, you know, and they still have to do it, okay? All the money that goes to that. You got this infrastructure problem. How much is the infrastructure problem? Estimates are all over the place, but no one thinks it's less than nine figures. Everyone thinks it's nine figures. So now, what does the standard development, what is the standard development response for how to deal with that? It's build a lot of residential housing because then you can assess those lots and that'll pay to put in the infrastructure. Now, that's great because now the infrastructure is paid for without coming onto our debt or general fund. 
But now you've just picked up a whole bunch of people that you need schools for, parks for, who are demanding services. And the revenue stream you pick up is only growing at a certain pace. And yet, because of the tube, you can't put a dense, a dense enough population there to create internal markets to create all the sales tax and the drivers that you need out there. You're limited. If this had been 50 years ago, you'd go to Uncle Sam or you'd go to Pat Brown, and they'd build you a new tunnel on the West End, and it would hook up to 880, and voila, the problem would be solved. Those days, my friends, are over. The post-war era is done. That's not going to happen. We are constrained. And that's the way it is. So the idea that you're going to go there and drive it, so of course every developer says we're going to build a lot of housing because they got to fund the infrastructure. If not, if you wait to do it on a business basis, how does the infrastructure get funded? And that is the conundrum that your staff and your council is left with now. My take on it is what I've called since the beginning you can't develop the point in one big project. It doesn't, it's so interesting to me that it doesn't matter whether people are liberals or, or, or conservatives or Republicans. Everybody in government always has a grandiose vision for everything. We need vision. We need vision, they always say. The thing is, in the real world, people who have visions are usually insane. It, 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 it's <laughs> what, 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 what we need, what we need is we don't score by swinging for the home run and striking out repeatedly. We score by a rally of singles. We develop modestly with a complete attention to what the market signals are, and more importantly, what does each development do for the existing bottom line of the city of Alameda, which is what we own, or what you all own and I work for. Um, that's how we're going to go forward. Now, exactly how that works, we focused on the Navy for the last 14 weeks. We're going to focus on finishing the MOA for the next 12 weeks. As soon as we get that MOA signed, we're going to be coming to council with ideas about how the base should be done. I don't want to discuss it tonight, but I'd be happy to come back after January when you have a meeting available, because you have a terrific speaker program, it sounds like. Be happy to come back and share those ideas with you. Uh, but I can tell you that it will not be overly reliant on housing. My belief is you create enough economic activity and jobs there first, and then you build the housing for environmental reasons and for jobs housing balance when you have that market there. You don't have housing drive the economic activity. You have the economic activity drive the housing. That's different than the way it was done in the 20th century. And unfortunately, the private sector players don't completely get that yet because they're equipped to do the massive home building style. But we can get this done. It's just going to take a long time. It's not going to happen in five years. It's going to happen prudently and carefully. Uh, so that's Alameda Point, uh, and that's huge. Um, and I mentioned earlier that because the Navy's gone, and because we only have these five other economic nodes left, we're basically like Piedmont. You look at Piedmont, it's interesting. They're super rich people in Piedmont. But when I had to do a traffic light at Grand Avenue and Jean Street at the Ace Hardware when I was a city council member in Oakland, because people were like running across the street with their bags of groceries, I went to Piedmont and said, this is partially yours. And they said, well, we don't have any money in our budget because we're all property tax. We don't have any money. I'm like, but you're rich. How can you not have any money? And they said, we don't have any money. I had to front the money out of Oakland to pay Piedmont's share, and they paid us back over three years just to get them to agree. They needed three years to pay their one half share of a $300,000 traffic signalization project. <laughs> and you know, I looked at their books. They weren't lying to me. They didn't have it. We don't want to be that. So we're going to have to accept that we need more economic activity. Um, finally. I talked with you a little bit about fees and about revenues. Now let's talk a little bit about expenses. In the future, government, many of you I'm sure read Reinventing Government 20 years ago. Al Gore was all about Rego, Reinventing Government. And the phrase there was, governments steer better than they row. Now, I believe that in the future, when you get away from core services, and I'm going to come back to what are core services. When you get away from core services, 
Things like the animal shelter, things like the golf course, things like parks, pools, all of those services. The government, we want those things. Those are the, 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 the huge amount of amenities that are here in Alameda are what make the city great. And Alameda, unlike many communities, has a huge advantage in the future, and right now as we move to the future, and that is a very, very active community in terms of volunteerism and voluntary associations. And that is something that's in the decline throughout the country. Alameda has a lot of people who care a lot about pools, or a lot of people who care a lot about the animal shelter, or a lot of people who care a lot about this park, or that park, or this football program, or that baseball program. In the future, I'm not saying tomorrow, but where I believe we have to move this government is to accept that the government is not the purveyor itself of services, but the director of the provision of services. Government does have an obligation to see that these services are provided, but they don't necessarily have to be provided in the 20th century model of a centralized bureaucracy coming up with policies and rules to deliver services through public employees. At the same time, and that means we need to be more nimble, a lot of, took a lot of heat. Lisa Goldman actually took a lot of heat for saying we're going to close down the animal shelter. Um, that was a beautiful moment, because then I got to come in and say, hey, we found some money. We can save the animal shelter for another six months. It wasn't choreographed or anything. Um, and, and, and we did it. And now, people originally started by organizing to say traditional, what was traditional sort of Saul Alinsky model, 20th century rabble-rousing organizing, get everybody together and bring them all down to City Hall to demand that the government pay for these you know, services we need. That's dead. Now what we need are people to get organized to do the services themselves with the assistance and under the umbrella of the community as a whole. That's where we're going. Now, in an ideal world, maybe that's not where we, should, where we ought to be going, but that is where we are going. And we're going to get there here in Alameda in a way that's humane and faster than anybody else. As to the animal shelter, the first meetings, folks were saying, we can't do this in five months. We need the city to continue to do this. Once it became clear that I'm extremely stubborn and that I meant it when I said the animal shelter would be closed if it wasn't part of a nonprofit solution, folks really got going. And they're doing great. And I'm not just saying that, because you know I don't BS. They're doing great. They're, I, I really believe we're going to be successful. And what we said to them was, look, we were prepared. We have to do animal control. I mean, it's part of public safety. We have to do that. We don't have to own an animal shelter. But the time it would spend us to have our animal control officers going to Fremont or going back and forth to San Leandro, that's a cost to us, too. We want you to be successful. And the money we would have paid to those cities to take our animals, we'll pay it to you, and we'll give you more than that to reflect the, the efficiency savings that we pick up. We want that here. I mean, we, Alameda, I believe, wants to be humane in these circumstances. And it makes sense to do it from a rational perspective. We're going to do this. And it's going to be the same model we're going to follow with other issues like that. We've already had discussions, for example, with the swimmers. OK, what are we going to do when eventually the high school pool that we are working on together, what are we going to do? Because any day, that thing is going to be a problem. It's a problem now. But any day, we're not going to be able to have swimmers there anymore. Then what? And what I've said to them is the city will look for, and we're working on it. I can't give you details. The city will look for appropriate land for you to build a swim center. We will give you the land. And we will reserve time for seniors and for low-income kids so that you will have a guaranteed portion of revenue stream coming in, knowing that some of your time will be booked. But you've got to build the swim center. 
and how big it's going to be and how cool it's going to be and maybe we can partner it with a warm water therapy pool and work together with the hospital district. There's all kinds of opportunities if you start thinking out of the traditional centralized city hall directs it and does it by collecting taxes from you and then we do it and your role in government is no more than consumer of services. The city is basically the pool company, the animal control company, the garbage company, the sand. That's done. And that's not healthy for democracy anyway. It, it fosters a real, I pays my taxes and I get my services mentality. That's not where we need to be. We need to be much more engaged in real ways, more than just coming down to City Hall and saying, I pay my taxes and I want this service. Who's going to do the service? That needs to be the question now. No discussion of the budget will be complete without a discussion of pensions and benefits. Now, let me say that my personal life, I made decisions early on not to, notwithstanding, and I don't say this, I'm not saying this to brag, I'm just saying this so you, I can set the stage. Okay? I have a Yale degree, and I have a top 10, and I have an NYU law degree. So I didn't go into public service because I couldn't get a job anywhere else. And I graduated with honors in both places. So it wasn't a question of, I had no choices, I had to be a legal aid lawyer. I made a conscious decision. It was a calling to me to do public service. First at Legal Aid, then in Oakland, and now here in Alameda. It was never for me about being elected so much as it was having authority to do good things. And yes, there's ego involved in that. Let's not kid ourselves. Of course there is. But I made decisions about not making the kind of money I could have made otherwise, in part because I knew I was going to have a pension. So as much as anybody, my entire program, I mean, I didn't finish paying my education. I didn't grow up with a silver spoon. My parents came to America when my mother was pregnant with me. So I didn't finish paying my education until I was 43 years old. And I didn't buy my first house until two years ago when I was 50. So I made those decisions. And I don't say that. I'm, I'm not saying that like, now give me a gold star. I did it because I wanted to. And I'm very happy with the choices I made. But I also relied upon the idea that at the end, I'm going to have a secure pension. We have got to get this pension thing under control, both for the people who are, like me, reliant, whose fiscal planning, financial planning depended on it, but also because we can't go on the way we have for the last 20 and 30 years, particularly in public safety. The um, premium for public safety personnel is in the 30s, meaning for every dollar you're paying almost 35, 40 cents per dollar for pension. We can't afford that anymore. Now, we are, it's, I think it's very simple to see that in the future, the people who are coming in are not going to get these 3% at 50 type packages. I think that's clear. And that solves, our, that solves that problem 30, 40 years from now, but it doesn't get us over this giant hump that we've got to get over now. I'm not saying anything to you that I haven't said directly, at least to the firefighters. I haven't talked to the police union this directly yet because I don't know them as well. But um, I, I have no problem with saying this publicly, and they won't be surprised to hear that I'm saying this. We can't go on like this. We need more. We need more contribution from public sector employees. I met with the public works department people today. I told them the same thing. Everybody's going to have to chip in some more. We're going to raise the fees to keep them low, but we're going to get some revenue there. Everybody's got to chip in more. It's not going to happen like that. It's going to happen over time, but we're going to have a way to do it that it doesn't kill anybody, that there's sticker shock on their paycheck, but we have to move in that direction. To that end, uh, I sent letters out today because, you know, the Grijalva report came out today. I just did an interview on that. We just did the thing with the Navy today. Uh, but, you know, there's always multitasking. I sent letters out today to 15 people who I've spoken with about being part of a um, pension reform task force. It's not a total budget reform thing. It is not even dealing with retiree medical. It is strictly the pensions. Because sometimes what happens is you study things and the focus is so broad, because it is all interlinked, of course. But the studies, the, it's, the focus is so broad that you can't really get your arms around it. I think it, you, you eat the meal bite-sized. So we're going to do pensions. Among other people, I've asked Kate Quick to participate uh, in that group. Everybody that I, can un that I understand 
every group that I can see that has weighed in on this issue has representation at the table. I've asked, um, I've asked Kate, I've asked representatives from the fire union and the police union, but I've also asked the city treasurer and the city auditor. I've asked, uh, I've asked Gretchen Lepo from, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right, but I've asked Gretchen, yeah, from, uh, who's uh, an active member of ACT. Uh, I've also asked um, um, Lisa Goldman, who I trust and I think did a great job as interim city manager. Um, I've asked uh, the HR director, Karen Willis. I've asked the police chief, the fire chief. Um, I've asked, blank in her name, but she was a supporter of Doug's who sits on the AMP board with me. Maggie Deaton. Uh, I asked Maggie because she works for, Maddie, Maddie Deaton, thank you. I've asked her. I'm trying to put together a group where every, I'm not looking for them to vote. What I can't, I don't, I don't believe things get studied and then, you know, we have an argument over, well, there's seven of this and six of that. I just want to have everybody positioned there at the table. And they're going to be chaired by a woman that you may have heard of named Laura Chick. Laura Chick was a council member in Los Angeles who became the uh, city auditor slash controller. Developed a reputation of being really hard line about good government. Love her. Um, she then was named uh, in the prior state administration as the state's inspector general to supervise and look over how stimulus money was being spent. So she's a real like focus in, no fraud, no waste kind of person. Her daughter had a baby and she re had retired. And so she moved from Southern California and now lives in Albany. And she, you know, because I'm the luckiest guy in the world, and I really am, I mean that in so many ways. She approached me through Courtney Ruby in Oakland, a good friend of mine, another someone who loves good government. She approached me and said, you know, I'm retired, but I'm still interested in doing public service. And uh, Courtney says, you're really good, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, do you have something for me to do? And I said, oh, I got something for you to do. <laughs> so then I had to persuade her to say yes. That took about a month. Um, but let me tell you what this group's going to go after. Two phases to the task force. First phase is um, I want to get real numbers. I want the group, and I believe the group can and should come to consensus over this. I want to get, and, they'll, and, and we'll have uh, actuarial assistance for them. I want to get an agreement on what is the range of the years in which we have a gap. What is the number of employees who we expect so we can chart them, and what is the gap going to be based on what we now have to look at as being you know, reasonable investment returns? What is that gap? And I believe that will take about four or five months for them to figure that out. And at the end, of course, because based on the assumptions you make, that will determine what numbers come out the other end. I anticipate we will have a range around which we can build consensus. So how long is the problem? And then what's the range of the problem in each year? Give us a range. Then the interesting part happens, the second phase. That's where we want the suggestions from everybody on how do you fix it. There we will not get consensus. OK, it's impossible. What's the vote? No vote. I anticipate that different groups of, of, of the task force members will come together based on their positions and their feelings and their philosophical underpinnings and they will come up with reports and suggestions. Maybe there'll be a majority report and a minority report. Maybe there'll be three, four reports out of 15 people. And then I'm, all gonna, I'm send, gonna send it all to the council. <laughs> and I'm gonna let the council use these very smart, good people, their best thinking, to have a real debate about how we go forward. That, and a debate based on a task force that had everybody or pretty much every position represented at the table. Now. I think it's really important even if just the first phase gets done. By the way, I have to tell you, I forgot one member. Hey, Tracy, I got to tell you this. One member of the, of the task force, Dick Spees, because he moved to Alameda. So I got Dick Spees to come in. Yeah, he lives in Alameda at Cardinal Point now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's what's coming. You cannot solve the long range budget problem for this town without addressing that issue. Now, different people have different feelings about you know, what's right and what's wrong and what, what was moral about these benefits and what, what I mean, 
there's all kind of positions. And that's great, and the council should have that discussion, and the public should have that input. I'm speaking of it purely as your CEO, looking at what the trend lines are, and what is possible and what is not possible. And it is my firm conclusion it is not possible to go on as we have. Okay, so that's the budget. One last thing, and then I'm done, and then I want to take some questions, and then I want to go home and see my kids and eat. Um, <laughs> golf is coming up. Now, I'm going to write an op-ed piece. You're going to see it. It's done, actually, but I didn't want to like, get, in, to get that in the way of the, the, the naval base and the Grijalva report and the task force and the Collins case and all the other stuff, where, you know, the Collins case, the boat works case, where we're going to make that guy tear down those horrible buildings. Um, you know, at a certain point, you don't want to start stepping on your own stories, right? Um, but the golf matter is really interesting to me. And I have only one point I want to make about it. And that is the current policy demand of the council and the city is that we should have 45 holes, not 27 and a 9 hole. We got to have all 45 holes. We got to make sure that the nine hole course is affordable, meaning a dollar a round, which is what kids pay, which is unbelievably cheap, a dollar a round. We've got to somehow come up with eight to nine million dollars to fix this, a lot of the stuff that we don't see, the irrigation, the drainage, and all those other things. And we're supposed to do all that without tapping the general fund. And I will tell you, that is impossible. That will not happen. I don't believe the people in Alameda will pay taxes specifically directed to golf. And I'm not even going to suggest we do that. But I will tell you that for those who are opposed to the current proposal that the staff is making, the future of that course, it really is in the balance. If we don't do the land swap, that's fine. And believe me, I, I mean, I love the course and I learned to play there. If we don't do the land swap, that's fine. But we still have to figure out where we're going to come up with this other money from, or we will eventually have to close part or all of the course. That's OK if we do it. If that's what people want to do, believe me. Like I said, I'm your technician now. If that's what you want to do, it's OK. But the direction I have to keep a 45-hole top quality municipal course and not hit the general fund and keep affordable rates for kids on the nine hole, it's hard to do it without some infusion of cash coming from some aspect. Last point, and I mean it's the last point. There are a lot of people who are against this deal for one reason and one reason only, and that's because we're doing business with Ron Cowan. Yeah. So let me tell you something. If we, now, there are other people who are against it because they don't want the housing and they're concerned about the traffic. And that's all completely legitimate. And that has to go through the planning commission. And everybody needs to have their say. And people may decide, we don't want to do that. That's OK. That's cool. But for those many people who I get emails from and who I get phone calls from, who the main issue is nothing to do with facts, but that they hate Ron Cowan, Here's what I have to say about that. If we vote no on this deal because we hate Ron Cowan, the next morning, Ron Cowan will still drive to work in a car that is much nicer than any car you and I will ever own. He will still live in a house much larger than you or I will, are likely to ever visit, let alone own. And he will still be a very rich man. All we will have done is poked him in the eye. And to poke him in the eye, we will risk something that I think is a fabulous community asset. Now, I have to admit, I'm a golfer, OK? I love the golf course. I really do. I learned to play there. I love it. I play there with my kids. It's affordable. It's a great municipal facility. But it really needs help. I don't understand people who are willing to sacrifice something that's important to this community just to poke a finger in a rich guy's eye. You don't have to like him to agree with what I'm saying. I'm not saying you should like him. I mean, a lot of the animus toward him, I'm sure, you know, is well deserved. And I'm sure part of it is also that, you know, back in 1962, he wanted to do the twist, but everybody else wanted to do the Watusi. I really don't care. <laughs> but I'm just saying, if you're going to examine this deal, Please examine the deal on the facts. There are differences of opinion about where we ought to be going. And that's, again, housing, traffic, cool. I'm OK with that. 
But this business of vilifying one person, even if he does deserve it, is not a reason to put a gun to our own head and come up with a situation where we will eventually end up losing it.